Okay, we're up. Thank you. Uh, thanks everyone for hosting me here, and thanks men for setting everything up. Uh, and I'm sorry if you came in here expecting the original talk. Uh, I really wanted to talk about the uh, actual state of crypto module in Node.js, but I figured that it'd be terrible to like talk to three people and uh, you know alienate the rest of the room. So let's instead do a quick uh, you know crypto 101 session. And uh, I'm sorry if you already know all of that stuff. Uh, and thank you uh, for attending my talk. So I'm Ujwa. Uh, you can find me on Twitter or GitHub on at Riser uh, If you hate the talk, please mention me in, in the rant you make on Twitter. Uh, and why are we doing this talk? So this is a quotation that I really like uh, from David Kahn. And he says, Few false men have more firmly grit. The, few false ideas, sorry, have more firmly grit the minds of so many intelligent men than the one that if they just tried, they could invent a cipher that no one could break. And that really captures the idea of the state of cryptography today. Because uh, after all, ev nothing that we really use is secure. Nothing is 100% secure. Everything is completely fallible. And it's really important that we follow the state of this ecosystem and really follow that we're using all the best practices, make sure that we're on the top of our game. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, as mentioned, I work on Node.js. I'm one of the core collaborators. I also help maintain Electron. So if you like that, then thank you. Uh, also work on a couple of related projects like LibUE. Uh, as of recently, I've been contributing more and more to V8 and then by extension TC39. Uh, helping out the entire JavaScript ecosystem. I've also been associated with Google Summer of Code before. Uh, yeah. A quick disclaimer. Uh, I'm going to throw, out, throw around the word crypto a lot. So what, what do I mean when I say crypto? Uh, this is really important uh, with, when I say stuff like, do we need crypto? Because we do need cryptography, right? But when I say, Crypto, I mean the crypto module in Node.js, and not TLS. It's something that's very closely related. It's maintained by the same team, but it's beyond the scope of this presentation. I also do not mean cryptocurrencies. <laughs> and if, if you're confused between these, my reaction is pretty much like, no. <laughs> please, please. But why do you need crypto? Uh, I assume a lot of people here work on front-end JS. And, uh, a lot of times I come across front-end JavaScript developers saying, oh, we have TLS. Why do we need cryptography? Like, that's pretty much all we need, right? But that's not exactly the case. You might need cryptography for a lot more things than just, you know, SSL. One of the things might be encryption. You might want to encrypt data uh, on front as well as the back end of your application. You might want to exchange keys between users uh, for video games and stuff. You might want to hash stuff cryptographically. Uh, you want to do data signing. Uh, that's something that's catching wind right now. Uh, you might want to generate secure random numbers. Uh, more on these later. Uh, just don't worry about you know, big names. And you might want to interoperate between different systems, maybe for running a huge application with a lot of services. Something's written in Python. Something's written in Ruby. You might want to interoperate with these. Uh, so talking about encryption, uh, what do we mean when we say encryption? Encryption is basically encoding user data to prevent unauthorized access. It upholds confidentiality of your data. Uh, and the way we enable people to do this in Node.js is by using Cypher and Decipher classes. Now, hold up. What is a Cypher? A cipher is basically an algorithm that we use for performing encryption. You cannot use these classes directly, uh, but you use something like create cipher or create decipher, which are methods that you use in Node.js for creating ciphers and deciphers. Now, we do not recommend that you use these. These, has, uh, these functions have been deprecated. Uh, why I build up on that? But if you want to do encryption stuff, we'd suggest that you use create cipher IV and create decipher IV. One of the reasons for that, I push the slides further, is that if you do not use an initialization vector, you get something like that. So actions speak louder than words, photos speak louder than actions. That's a picture of Tux uh, 
encrypted without an initialization vector. It's still pretty obvious what it is, right? Uh, so initialization vectors add security and randomness to your encryption. Uh, if you use create cipher, it might be insecure. If you use some in, in if you use create cipher with counter mode or GCM or CCM, it might be like flat out insecure. We print out a warning if you do that, but please don't. Uh, now, if you reuse your IV, it also might cause vulnerabilities. So it's, it's really important that you follow the best practices in this subject. Uh, and, and most importantly, you use these functions. So we did a couple of stuff for that. But basically how encryption works is that you have a cipher function which you feed your plain text and the initialization vector to with the key. And you put the ciphertext and IV on the receiver's end for the decipher. And as long as the same corresponding key has been entered, uh, we get the correct main text. <coughs> so that's pretty cool, right? Uh, how we do this in Node.js is by using the create cipher IV function. You enter the encryption algorithm. Right now I'm using AES. And then you call create cipher, uh, cipher update with the plain text. Uh, that's the input encoding that you have your plain text in. It's usually UDF8 if you're writing in English. If you have multiple characters, you might use a different encoding or some sort of Unicode. And the output has to be hexadecimal. And then we do the final encryption phase and then push that to encryption. The encrypted text could then be deciphered using the decipher, create decipher IV, and then updating the decipher object with the same cipher decks. So that works. Uh, about key exchange, what even is key exchange? So key exchange is securely exchanging keys over a public channel. You might want to exchange keys for a lot of reasons, maybe just like the last step we talked about. And it's very, uh, it's usually uh, often, you know, common for people to not find a way to exchange keys over a private network. It's really hard to find a private shared network. And if you have a private network, just share the data over that. So if you want to do stuff over an insecure channel, over a public channel, you use a key exchange algorithm. Why even bother? Uh, because it's, it's one of the ways to agree upon a key for a conversation, before a conversation. Uh, if, if you didn't know, it's a very difficult problem to solve because there's two parties communicating over a public channel, and it's really hard to have a shared secret without you know, leaking any information in the middle. Uh, how it's solved in Node is there's two ways of doing it. There's a prime number-based method, and there's an elliptic curve-based method. Now, that's a lot of weird math stuff, but uh, for you it's easy. You can use the Diffie-Hellman class or ECDH classes. Basically how it works is there's two parties involved. This, let's name them Alice and Bob. Uh, Alice computes a secret key that's secret to herself. Uh, she doesn't share it with anybody else. Bob computes his own secret key. Uh, they both have a shared public, uh, public constant. Let's call it P. They calculate PKA and PKB. And then they transfer PKA and PKB over the network. Now the catch here is that it's impossible to get the original value of KA by just looking at PKA. So anybody who's sitting in the middle does not know what KA or KB is. They now know what PKA and PKB are, and uh, they're unable to deduce uh, the values of KA and KB. On the other hand, Alice and Bob can just find out this final value, PKA, KB, but the attacker in the middle has no way to figure that out. So it's pretty nifty, huh? Uh, how you do it is somewhat convoluted. Uh, it might be a bit too much, but if you just bear with me, uh, you just get the prime and the generator function uh, of the key using the create Diffie-Hellman method. And you take that secret of Alice to Bob, who uses, the Alice, uh, who uses Alice's key to compute his secret. And Alice uses her, uh, Bob's key to compute her secret. And then you could verify that they're the same thing. Same with ECDH. Uh, hashing, hashes are probably the most commonly used 
primitives that you must have heard about. I mean, pretty much everybody, I assume, would have heard about checksums and, and verifying data uh, transfer on the internet. What is hashing? Uh, it's quite literally the use of hash functions. That does not help a lot. Uh, hash functions actually map arbitrarily long data to actually a fixed size bit strings. So you might remember having huge files and then just calculating a checksum which is fixed size from that string. Uh, it's hard to invert, that's the whole point. It's collision resistant, so you cannot find out a different set of data that maps to the same checksum. And because of that, you it's very easy to calculate the checksum of any given uh, data or a file, but it's really hard to do the opposite. So that's why they're used for verification and authentication stuff. They uphold authentication and integrity of data. Integrity is really important here because you, when you're dealing with data on the public internet, you might want to know for sure that it's the, it's the exact same thing that reached you, right? Uh, they help with the tough stuff. Uh, one of the reasons they're so common is that they're probably the farthest from an actual crypto systems. They're usually used as utilities uh, inside other, you know, completely built crypto systems, and we'll see that. Uh, for example, data signing uses hashing extensively. HMAX, which is hash-based message authentication systems, they used hashes also. Uh, the way you do it inside of Node.js is using the hash class and the HMAC class for specifically doing HMAX. So that's pretty much how it looks. You have an arbitrary length data or a message or file, whatever. You feed it to the hash function and it produces a fixed hash value. Uh, it's pretty simple how to calculate a hash. Uh, you just input the hash function. There's, there's a couple of hash functions that you should and should not use. SHA 256 is what Bitcoin and all this uh, cryptocurrencies use. Uh, it doesn't mean you should use them, but uh, it's pretty secure still. You just update what data you want to feed to the hash and then produce a digest. If you see HMAX, they're pretty much the same. Uh, they just require a secret to verify that the message is not only uh, authentic, but it's also sent by the same person that you think it was sent by. So it's like a sort of password, if you may. Uh, for data signing, that's uh, just one extra layer over uh, encryption as well as hashing, if you may. Data signing uh, involves presenting the authentic authenticity of digital documents and messages. Uh, it involves authentication of data and also non-reputation. So non-reputation is important. When, you, when I say non-reputation, uh, that, that's actually a very important thing about signing, right? Uh, one of the things that signatures are used in the physical world is that you sign a document and then you can't go back on that, right? If you sign something, then you say, okay, I've put my signature on this document. And for time memorial, anybody could verify that, okay, it is in fact your signature that you put on the document. You can't take it back. So when I say non-reputation, I mean that once signed, uh, a document can, like for all posterity, it could be verified that a certain person signed that document. It also ensures integrity of the document. You do them with the sign and verify classes. Sorry, I'm rushing through this. It's just, it's, a, it's an hour long presentation that I basically have to do in 20 minutes. Uh, but yeah, how you do these uh, is that you, ha you have your data that you put through a hash function. The hash function is encrypted using the signer's private key. The certificate and the signature are attached together to produce digitally signed data. This digitally signed data can then be broken down at the receiver's end into the data and the signature. Uh, and then the signature could be verified to be the, the encrypted version of the hash of your data. So that's pretty nifty. Uh, how you do that is quite close to how you do hashing in Node. Uh, you just create a sign using the hash method. So that's pretty much the only moving part in the signing protocol, just which hash method to use. You update the data, you get your private key somehow, uh, and then you put in your signature, your computer signature, and you verify them using pretty much the same way. So uh, random number generation. Uh, so random numbers are really important, right? They're really important for cryptography, they're really important for a lot of reasons. Uh, in most cases, they're sprinkled on top of existing crypto systems to make things secure. 
Uh, cryptographic applications require a lot of random numbers. Uh, key generation, initialization vectors, and salts, and all these weird math things. Do not use math.random. So I cannot stress on this more. I've seen a lot of people use math.random for a lot of really important and, and secure stuff. It's, it's not secure. It can be completely broken down. It has literally no entropy at all. And uh, the people who build the spec for math.random do not suggest that you use math.random. Use math.random pretty much never. Uh, Random bytes and random fill are the two functions that we provide. They're very secure if you compare them with math.random. And uh, I cannot agree more with Robert Akavu, who says the generation of random numbers is too important to be left to chance. Uh, you can do the, that synchronously using just random bytes, or again, asynchronously using random bytes. It's just standard Node.js if you feed in a uh, Callback, it does stuff asynchronously. Same with random fill, just a buffer needs to be created. Interoperability, so that's important. There's a lot of great crypto libraries uh, that we absolutely do not use. Uh, we use OpenSSL uh, because we only have the time and energy to work on one crypto library at a time. Uh, one of them is Bouncy Castle. If you use Java or C Sharp, you know Bouncy Castle uh, or Salt uh, for C, Lipsodium for C and PyCryptodome for Python. And there's a lot more, uh, and people love to use these libraries in, in different uh, applications and in different services that they built on these languages. Node.js, on the other hand, op use OpenSSL. Uh, you might not agree with me on these, but I, we do not have any regrets. Uh, Web crypto is really important. So if you're a friend in JavaScript developer, you probably know about Web crypto by now. Uh, Web Crypto is uh, a really high-level API that allows you to securely do crypto stuff on the browser. It's really cool, and you don't need to import megabytes worth of libraries for you to do that and still be insecure. Uh, it's built into the browser. It's now a spec uh, that, that's maintained, co-maintained by W3C and TC39. It's really cool. We're building that in V8. And one of the pain points in Node.js is that because Node.js is used for server-side applications alongside uh, the web so much, people expect the Node.js crypto library to just blankly work with web crypto. And unfortunately, that's not the case yet. Uh, it's not perfectly interoperable. We're trying to make it more and more interoperable. Sadly, the requirements and the use cases for cryptography are very, uh, are very different on the server side than they are on the front end. And for example, Web Crypto deals with a lot of 2FA stuff that's really important on front end, but like, why would you do 2FA on the server? Uh, but yeah, we're working on that. Uh, it's a really high value target for Introp, and uh, your opinions are being heard. If you want to talk about Web Crypto, you can find me later, but yes. Boring SSL is an important case. Uh, Boring SSL is the fork of OpenSSL that's used in Electron and Chromium. Uh, it's sort of like Google's take on OpenSSL. Google just forked OpenSSL and made sure that nobody else can use it. Uh, sadly, Electron, because it embeds Chromium, it needs to m find a way to make Boring SSL and OpenSSL works because it has Node and Chromium, like both. Uh, and it needs to juggle these somehow. Uh, we try to work as much as we can uh, to make these work together. Sometimes there's breaking chains between these, but it, it's also one of the bigger targets that we focus on. Uh, and we actually, we cannot talk about this. So that's pretty much it for, no, 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 no. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, uh, we thought that you'd love to talk about some of the TC39 stuff that I've been working on. I, uh, despite not being like one of the actual, uh, you know, representatives uh, representing like an organization like Google or Mozilla, I still work on some of these things. So if you want to contribute or like get started with how things work when you specify JavaScript, uh, you could definitely ask a question. There's not enough time to ask questions right now, but you could find me later. And uh, I'd love to 
but help you out. That's all. So how it's going to happen is we're going to give five minutes for any questions about open source, about TC39. Um, yeah, because it's very rare that we get someone who's uh, so involved in that space to be here. So raise your hands and we will give you a microphone. That's one. Okay. Right, sorry, just, just the one question about the crypto talk. I, I really appreciate it. Um, so the scenario I'm thinking about is this. Uh, I'm a developer. I, my users' data uh, and funds are important, but, and I need to encrypt things, but I'm stupid, and I don't want to think. And I don't want to make choices, mm -hmm. and I don't want to think about like, what algorithms you use, what I do. Thank you. That's, that's an amazing question. Uh, that's actually one of the, the problems that has been haunting the, the whole crypto team in Node.js and me personally a lot. Uh, Every other like 3 a.m. I'd wake up. It's like, oh shit, uh, people can't use cryptography. Uh, there's a problem with with uh, the crypto model in Node.js. If you didn't notice, uh, it's terrible. Uh, it's terribly designed, uh, and it's uh, actually so. Uh, there, there's this running joke in the team uh, when we added uh, the functionality to use Scrypt, which is a verification and password generation algorithm. Uh, one of my uh, one of my friends and colleagues, JoePy91. He actually created an NPM module and named it Scrypt for humans. And the problem is that the crypto library doesn't work well for humans. And uh, that's because it offers you a lot of choices. And that's because we don't want to restrict you. We, no matter how powerful of a user you are, we want to enable you to do pretty much everything. And uh, one of the awesome things that could be done, is, and I, I am working on that, is that it's personally my personal repository right now, but uh, easy crypto. Oh no! <laughs> 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 mm. Easy crypto. So uh, safer, easier to use, and beginner friendly. So yay! Uh, if you're a beginner, you can just make. Crypto easy to use, make crypto safe to use, and require as little crypto specific knowledge as possible. You don't need a mad degree to do crypto. You should not need a mad degree to do crypto. And that's pretty much what I'm working on. Uh, hopefully, uh, if I get more time to work on this in a couple of weeks, this could get fully fleshed out with a lot of features. And this could be merged into Node.js. So you'd, uh, instead of like some random guy slash easy crypto, you'd probably use Node.js slash easy crypto. And, Pretty much everybody who's involved in Node.js crypto is working on this right now as we speak. And yeah, great, great question. Thanks. And this is definitely something that we care about. Okay, we have one more question. Hi. Um, thanks for your great talk. Um, and I'm, I'm just a little bit interested in your uh, personal story. Like, how did you get so, like, I, I think a lot of us are, like, amazed that you can get so deep. Um, and obviously, it's, a, it's an intense personal interest. But how do you, like, fall down? How do you even start, like, <laughs> uh, getting involved in this kind of uh, problem? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, it, I think, like, my personal, st personal story, I think the catch is that I'm, I'm usually too impatient uh, to wait around for nice things to happen. And uh, that's, for some reason, that has brought me, like, uh, if, you, if you just look in this way, it has brought me a lot of success in the sense that I, I was writing Node.js modules. Uh, there's certain things that are not available in Node.js or, like, nobody's working on them. And one week later, I am contributing to Node.js. Uh, a month later, I'm one of the core contributors. Then there's weird shit in V8 that nobody's like looking into, and then like a few weeks later, I started working on V8. I'm just too impatient to like let people let let things take due course uh, of time uh, because like in open source things are really slow, and sometimes the features that you want might take weeks, if not months, to land, and uh, sometimes it's just faster to just go ahead. And I think that's the catch. Uh, I, everybody here, I see great JavaScript developers. A lot of you build really awesome applications. It's just that uh, you know sometimes you gotta go out there and say, you know what, I'll just do this for you because you can. Uh, and and that's one of the reasons why I I've started going out and talking to all these awesome people at also awesome conferences and meetups. Is that 
everybody should at some point step up, step up and say, you know what, I want to work on your project. I want to work on the JavaScript language. I want to work on this API. And uh, it, it makes everybody's life easier. It, makes, it would make my life easier if you come up to me and say, you know what, I just want to maintain it. And you'd be surprised at how welcoming and how amazing and helpful people are. I have had like one-on-ones with, with V8 engineers at Google who I never thought would like give me a minute of their time because they're so helpful, they're so welcoming. They want people to help out. And the only reasons, uh, the only thing that is stopping you from working on those projects is yourself. Uh, if you just uh, decide to one day go ahead and, and work on those, there's no way you cannot get uh, your name at chromium.org. If there are any other questions, feel free to. Uh, oh yeah, no, okay. Let one more, one more. Okay. But anyways, oh yeah, sorry. But actually, I'm very bad with time. Uh, first of all, thank you for contributing. No, no.